For two decades, Darwin maintained a self-imposed dual role. As an acclaimed public figure, his work on natural history inspired respect. At the same time, he was writing evolutionary material, which he thought was potentially seditious. Darwin was finally forced to act when faced with the threat that his work was about to be overshadowed. Darwin was unsure of his facts, unsure of his data. He was continually experimenting, continually working on his specimens and wanted to perfect things even more. He was only pushed into publication by Russell Wallace's publication, which Wallace sent him from Malaysia, and that moved Darwin to publish his own theory rather earlier than he was ready. And Darwin was persuaded by his colleagues that he couldn't really sit on it for much longer. Um, and in the end, he agreed to publish a joint paper with Wallace. Uh, and that was the following year, Origin was published in itself. The Origin of the Species was published in 1859. And the immediate reaction from the church was quite muted. But after a bit, there were those who were passionately involved in the debate uh, and who were against Darwin. Uh, there were those who wanted to uh, in enjoy uh, what Darwin had offered uh, and relate it to Revelation. Uh, and, and, and this for them was a challenge to theology. You must remember that still in the 1850s, F.D. Morris, a very important theologian, thought that the Earth was merely 6,000 years old. So this involved really quite a revolution in ideas for many theologians, and it was very difficult for them to stomach it all at once. The idea was that somehow each individual person was created individually by God, and if evolution were the case, then this falls to the ground. Much of Darwin's research was done in the grounds of Down House. His daily walks along here, the sand walk, enabled Darwin not only to think through his scientific findings, but also to observe the complexities of nature. The sand walk was obviously a very important part of the garden for him, and also for Emma. Um, he would go out and walk around it a number of times every day, and it's clear that he used his walks around the sand walk to clear out his mind, to work out difficult problems, and for that reason, it was important for him. The nature of genius is such that it is often driven by obsession, and Darwin's overwhelming obsession was his work. He worked every day at Down House, Neither his seclusion at Down nor his health was to limit Darwin's scientific investigations. Unable to work for more than a few hours at a time, he devised an unvarying daily routine in which he balanced periods of work and rest. Darwin was quite clearly a creature of habit. He liked a regular routine and he liked to follow it very carefully. Darwin had a fairly you know, rigid daily program which involved getting up early, having breakfast at 7.45 on his own, um, walking briefly around the sand walk, returning to his study, uh, being read to by his wife <laughs> at uh, sort of 10.30, another work period, um, then five laps around the sand walk and lunch, and so it continued through the day with periods of, of work, reading, walking. During the early years of his marriage, Darwin suffered a whole catalogue of illnesses, including stomach cramps, headaches and palpitations, which increased in frequency and potency throughout his life. It is not clear what these symptoms denote. Many theories have been advanced, ranging from allergic reactions to Chagas disease. What is undeniable is that the symptoms often appeared in their most serious form when Darwin was under stress. Now, those bouts of extreme illness were often brought on by something 
changing or something frightening in his life. So, you know, there could a case be made that, yes, it was partly psychosomatic, it certainly made his illness worse when something, you know, unexpected happened. Um, and it certainly limited his travel. It may be that he didn't want to actually travel and face people, particularly after The Origin was published. But I think anybody reading his health diary couldn't really conclude anything else that he was actually sick from the number of symptoms he wrote down. Throughout their life together, Darwin depended totally on Emma and her undoubted devotion to him. During his rest periods, she would read to him from his favourite literature. Emma proofread all his work, including The Origin of Species. I think most people who've read about Emma Darwin, his wife, realise that without her support throughout their married life, he could not have achieved anything near what he managed to. She was a devout Christian while his own faith faded. Um, she didn't argue with him about religion. She accepted his work as what was important to him. But she gave him throughout his life very close support. She would read to him for up to four or five hours a day, which is a great commitment from a partner. Um, and she also had advantages. She spoke several languages, and she could read German, for example, which Charles couldn't. Uh, and many of the scientific works at that day were being produced in Germany, and so she was able to translate for him. Um, so it was very much a, a partnership. In 1859, Darwin had shook the foundations of Victorian society with his publication of The Origin of Species. This groundbreaking book proposed a theory of evolution which was dependent on natural selection. In the course of the controversy which raged, Darwin was dubbed the most dangerous man in England. A more unlikely recipient of such a title cannot be imagined. What Darwin had not anticipated was the origin of species commercial success. It was to run into many editions and be translated into several languages for publication abroad. It has remained in print ever since. One reason for the book's popularity was its style. Darwin presented his findings and theories in a form which was both interesting and accessible. The origin of species was not the province of a scientific elite. It appealed to an increasingly literate public. The book became the focus of attention for the scientific world, the church, and society as a whole. One of the most public manifestations of the dispute between the supporters of the book and its opponents took place in June, 1860. There was a meeting of the British, British Association for the Advancement of Science in Oxford, and there was an enormous row there. Huxley was uh, really quite seriously abused by Bishop Wilberforce. The reason wa was that theologians, a number of theologians, thought that this was against the doctrine of creation. Although the argument had raged between representatives of science and religion, opinion was not clearly divided along those lines. Antagonism to Darwin came from scientists as well as clergymen. Many scientists, while accepting the idea of evolution, were unwilling to set aside God and attempted to combine evolutionary principles with a creationist stance. For the church, the emergence of Darwin's theory of natural selection was a threat to the biblical story of creation on which its teachings were based. The accumulation of scientific evidence presented the church with a dilemma. In 1996, more than a hundred years after the publication of The Origin of Species, the Roman Catholic Church confirmed its belief in the validity of evolution. It was stressed, however, that this validation did not extend to any aspect which undermined the belief that the human soul was a gift from God. The great difficulty perceived in Darwin's theories for the doctrines of the Church was how to reconcile evolution with the idea that God implants a soul directly in each human being. 